second and 17, and they get to him again with Sue. Curry inside the five, and Gary with a touchdown. Caught, and that's Amari Cooper off to the races. Touchdown Raiders. And now, move the sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. What's up, everybody? DJ Bucky here, back on Move the Sticks. Buck, uh, man, another, another weekend. We had some wild games in the NFL this week, man. Man, kind of crazy when you think about like how competitive the National Football League is. People playing these tightly contested games, teams rallying back from significant deficits. Every week is must-see TV. Or I can't even say TV. Must, must-see everything because we had the game on Yahoo with the Bills and the Jags. Talking about 33 million people watched that on your wow. phone or your iPad or your computer. That's kind of crazy. When you yeah, I was actually I was actually driving into work while that game was going on, so I just had the I had it, uh, my phone in the seat next to me just so I could listen to the audio and you know the video was playing there on Yahoo. But man, I'm just like first of all, I love the fact that we have games at 6:30 uh, all West, day. West Coast time. Yeah, all day like a quadruple header. We got a chance to see games all throughout the day. That's kind of crazy. All right, we got a, a jam-packed episode today. We're going to touch on a lot of ground. Uh, TD, TD, you want to jump in here and tell the good folks what we got coming up today? Definitely. Today's On today's show, we have uh, three things that stood out to us in week seven that stood out to you guys. I'm um, just here watching here with Will Powell and the rest of the crew. Um, we also have a new segment we're debuting. Who would you rather have? And the headline of this is Amari Cooper, Odell Beckham, my boy Odell Beckham. And then lastly, Coach Bick is going to join us and talk uh, coaches on the hot seat. Well, coaches on the hot seat. Yeah, I guess it's that time of year. Uh, we'll get into that, Buck. But let's kind of start off with the things that stood out to us. There's three things that we, when we got together and talked about it, we kind of you know, trying to look all this information from a Sunday, a weekend, and kind of put it in and say, okay, what are the three top deals? Uh, number one, Tom Brady and what he did has to be number one, right? Absolutely. I mean, the fact that he was able to pick apart the Jets' number one ranked defense, uh, as talented as they are up front and in the back end, he didn't have any issue moving the ball up and down the field, and this is a guy that did it without the really the support of a running game. The fact that they just rear back, and this is what the Patriots do. When they don't think that they can run against the defense, they don't even attempt to Why do it. Why waste the time? They put it in the hands of their best player. They empty it out, spread it out, and they go to the spread and shred attack, and they did it successfully. He found a way to make play after play after play. There you see him uncovering, getting Gronkowski open for a touchdown. I mean, he's just magnificent in the pocket. I don't think you can find anyone that is better in terms of what he has been able to do for the length of time in his career. Uh, my thing is, though, if you're the Jets and you look at what happened this game, okay, their running backs produced, the New England Patriots running backs produced one rushing yard. <laughs> so they had one, one rushing yard, out, and Tom Brady had 15 on his own, but one rushing yard from their running game. The Patriots dropped, dropped double-digit passes, 10-plus passes that they dropped. They had them in third and long the entire game. Tom Brady had four conversions of third, uh, on third and long. So third and seven plus, I mean, third and 10, third and 17, one he converted with his legs. Uh, all this going for you. And, and your quarterback, Fitzpatrick, plays a really, really good really football good game. game, and it's still not enough to beat these guys. No, I mean, it, it, it speaks to the greatness of Tom Brady. Um, I think a lot of times from a defensive standpoint, you dare the quarterback to take the dink and dunk because you don't believe that he is patient enough to really use – that approach to win games. But Tom Brady has kind of flipped the script because he's very comfortable throwing quick passes out to his guys, Amendola, Edelman, allowing them to kind of make plays after the catch and have a level of success. And they've done this for years, but his patience, how deliberately he attacks the defense is something that I haven't seen in my lifetime. This guy just understands how to get it done. And he consistently leads the pages to the winner circle despite lacking an all-star cast on the perimeter. One thing that's interesting to me, too, is when you, when you throw the ball that much, there's kind of two schools of uh, thought here. When you throw it that much, okay, we have to protect Tom Brady. And I personally, I don't think that their, their five up front are all that great, especially mm -hmm. some of the injuries that they've had. So it's kind of you kind of go back and forth. Okay, do we want to max protect? we want to have six, seven-man protections in here? Or, or do you want to just get everybody out into the route and let Tom Brady just play point guard and get rid of the ball? And to me, uh, you got Tom Brady – Get as many options as you can out there. Put five linemen in there and let him just, just dink and dunk you right down the field. I mean, the way they play is very similar to the way the Golden State Warriors play basketball. You kind of open up the floor, allow your guy to really find a way to, to, to take advantage and exploit those matchups. By emptying the formation, he's able to, at the line of scrimmage, quickly decipher whether they're blitzing or if they're in coverage mode. And then he knows where to go with the football. And the one thing about Tom Brady, he was never a guy that was kind of the risky gunslinger like a Brett Favre, he was a guy that kind of methodically 
picked you apart. And so he just stays true to who he is. He takes what you give him, and then when he has an opportunity to take a shot, he delivers. Yeah, we'll move on to the next one here. My last point there on Tom Brady and the, and the Patriots, though, is discipline. We talk about discipline off the field. We talk about discipline on the field. To be able to play that style, you can't get off schedule. That means you got to limit your, your penalties. you got to limit bad plays. Uh, you're not going to turn the ball over. I mean, all these things, they do such a good job. It's a disciplined team. Very disciplined, but this funny thing is you talk about 10 drop passes. In looking at that and taking that approach, that's what will kill you. Because if you drop a pass on first down, then you got second and long. It, it kind of prevents you from sticking with the dink and dunk approach. They made a lot of plays on third and long. You alluded to them converting four third and long yardage situations. Ideally, you want, you want to stay away from yeah. those. This is against Tom the best Brady's, defense in the NFL. Tom Brady's been so good that he's been able to help them get past it. But when they get down the stretch, they still have to be able to run the ball and have to avoid being in those long yardage situations because that's really when the bad stuff happens. All right, season savers. And this might sound odd, especially talk about the Redskins and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Their records aren't going to wow you, but because of the divisions in which they play, these are huge comeback wins for them. The Jags blew a huge lead. They had a huge lead over Buffalo in that game over in London. Uh, Buffalo comes storming back, but then Bortles showed some, uh, some poise and some promise for a youngster. Go ahead and win that game. And then Kirk Cousins had the big, uh, the big comeback win. And uh, how did you feel about that win, uh, TD? You like that? You like that? You're darn right you like that. Bucky, <laughs> these, these are season savers at this point in time. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, because the Redskins season was teetering on the brink. There was a lot of conversation about Kirk Cousins, what his limitations are at the quarterback position. Is it time for them to move on to him, maybe turn to Colt McCoy or the like? But the fact that he was able to rally them back from a significant deficit, they're able to walk away with the win, it kind of keeps the flame alive in Washington. And more importantly, they're now only one game back in the division race. So they still have a chance of winning the division. They fall back, you don't think. I don't think that they continue to play the, with the level of emotion and enthusiasm and intensity that they played. But now that they've won, you get a little confidence, you play a little, di play a little different, uh, you charge up on defense. And offensively, not only do they have more confidence, but I think they may have found another playmaker in Jordan Reed. Yeah, Jordan Reed. To me, really two guys. You got Jordan Reed and also Jamison Crowder, the rookie out of Duke. Yes. Uh, did a nice job. I don't, it's weird to ask you questions about a Duke player while you're rocking your Carolina jacket. <laughs> but uh, no, look, he, he's turned out to be a nice player. They're doing all this without Deshaun Jackson. So maybe you get him back in the mix, add another weapon, give him somebody else that can stretch the field. But Jordan Reed, to me, flexing him out and being able to hit him on a couple slants for touchdowns, to me, that's that's where you get your mismatch player in this offense. Yeah, he's you a like guy. That. More people. You like that! <laughs> TD's not going to ever stop playing more, that. More people are finding out that the tight end is where you can create the mismatch. It's being able to spread him out, being able to take advantage of a guy that has athleticism to make plays in space away from the line of scrimmage. He can do that. But Jamison Crowder, Jamison Crowder played at Duke. Um, he was a guy that may, he may have left Duke as the all-time leader in receptions in the ACC. When I watched him coming out of school, um, I took some grief because I kind of likened him to Antonio Brown when Antonio Brown was coming out of Western Michigan. I thought they had similar traits in, in terms of their stop-start ability, the ability to make plays not only as a receiver but as a punt returner. I think this is going to be a guy that grows into a more prominent role in this offense. And when you surround him with a Deshaun Jackson and Pierre Garçon making some plays, I think Jamison Crowder can be a guy that is one of those sneaky playmakers that we end up talking about for a long time. All right, before we move on real quick to the Jacksonville Jaguars, I'm going to go off topic. Uh, my son's flag football team had lost four games in a row, and uh, we needed a win in the worst way, Buck. We get right. this thing. We, we tie it up late. We get to overtime. The overtime rules for youth flag football in Murrieta, California, are the best overtime rules ever, ever. Here's what they do. You put the ball at the 50-yard line. Team, team A... You get three, one, three, oh, plays, three plays. How three far plays. You move it? However far you go, they drop a cone down. Okay, you made it this far. Other team, you got three plays to get the ball further than that cone. So they only got the ball about eight yards, right? So my son, first, first down, drop pass. Second down, drop pass. Now it's third. We got to get like seven yards. This is the game online, seven yards. Scramble. They blitz him. He can allow to run. Not allowed to run. Oh. So he's scrambling around, scrambling around, kind of like falling down, throws it. Our kid like lays out at like eight yard mark. So it's an eight-yard completion, and these 11-year-old kids, uh, you thought they just won the Super Bowl. It was, it was fantastic. I'm thinking, you like that's, that? Yes. You like that? That's what I was saying as a father on the sidelines. <laughs> Pointing over to the other dads. You that, like that? That's what I hit them with. <laughs> so, no, it was, yeah, but I was like, this is the genius. This is the best overtime rules I've ever seen. That, that's, that's pretty creative. All right, that's but yeah, I'm glad you got goes. to get you like that. One more time. One more time. You like that? Yeah, I like you that. You like that? There's so no, much angst in that, though. There's so many layers. Oh, I love it. He's talking to RG3. 
He's talking to everyone who doubted him. Everyone. Well, no he, one he, he needs to go easy because he has to play again. Uh, I, I, look, I'm happy. Too bad he can't walk up into the sunset like John Elway, but <laughs> he's going to have to suit that thing up again, and we'll get the chance to see him. Uh, yeah, look, Kirk's a good guy. I was glad to see him have a good moment there. Jaguars, real quick, Buck. This team, we've, we've touched on it before. Young talent. they got a lot of young offensive skill talent. Now I think, yeah, look, they're still in the division race here this year. That's why I talk about this being a season saver. Not the craziest thing in the world to think the Jaguars could actually be a playoff team this year. No, they could be a playoff team if they just focus on winning the AFC South. Look, the Indianapolis Colts are not playing well. Andrew Luck is not playing well. Defensively, they can't get enough stops. They, they're older, um, and that age is, is finally creeping up with them. The Houston Texans lose their best player in Aaron Foster. They have quarterback issues. They can't get it done. So when I look at the Jacksonville Jaguars, they absolutely have an opportunity to make a push and a run at this division title. Ideally, I think it's their defense that leads the way. Their defense plays hard. Um, Telvin Smith, not, I mean, a nice they play player. hard. They were able to get turnovers from the Buffalo Bills. They run and chase to the football. They're still buying into what Gus Bradley is teaching. And then on offense, Allen Robinson, Allen Hearns, those guys are really making plays. You saw Julius Thomas show up a little bit. And TJ Yeldon being a factor yeah, that's running a big the ball. One. He can alleviate some of the pressure on Blake Bortles. It kind of takes Blake from being the primary playmaker to being a guy that's more of a complimentary player, which I think is best for his skill set at this time. All right, team nobody's talking about, and we've talked about them on here because we love their young front seven, and we're both Teddy Bridgewater fans. But the Minnesota Vikings, uh, look, Quietly, what are they, 4-2 and two right now? 4-2, and two, playing really well. Playing really good football, and they might just have kind of a young emerging star at the wide receiver position, Stephon Diggs. Man, Stephon Diggs has come on like game busters. Fifth round pick coming out of Maryland. Did you know him coming out? He's a big time high school. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew him coming out. I'd been around him. I'd seen him. I watched him. And early in his career in Maryland, he was sensational. A guy that made a lot of plays. Was dinged up and hurt the last part of his tenure there, so you didn't really get a chance to see him kind of do what he's been able to do for the Minnesota Vikings, but he was the guy that was number one for Maryland. He was their guy that you built it around. They threw it to him everywhere, and you can see him make plays as a returner in the, in the passing game. You're seeing that happen for the Minnesota Vikings. I dare say that he may be their number one receiver because he makes plays. He's been productive. And this catch here where he lays out and goes and gets Woo. it, that is a way to endear yourself to the quarterback. Teddy Bridgewater will continue to find him because he's a guy that's making plays for him right now. Yeah, he's somebody when, look, he got hurt. So his sophomore year, he, he barely played and then came back uh, last year. Solid numbers at Maryland, 62 catches, 792 yards, five mm -hmm. touches. I mean, just didn't wow you. But I remember, like, he's one of those guys, when you watch him as a freshman, you're like, whoa, who is this dude? Yeah, absolutely. You thought he was going to be a big star at Maryland. You thought he would really step up and have – Tremendous amount of production when he came out. And there was some time, remember, because he was there with Sammy Watkins and, and the other stuff. Like, people really talked about Stefan Diggs being a He had a couple, had a couple kick returns for touchdowns as a freshman, too. So you know, he kind so of burst on the scene. Burst on year. the scene. And so, saw him in preseason this year, and he was starting to get it. He was starting to make plays in the return game, kind of earned his way onto the team. And then they still didn't play him early, but a Charles Johnson injury opened the door for him to get on the field. And now he's on the field making plays. He just kind of further pushes down. Cordero Patterson and some of the other guys they have because you have to keep this guy on the field. And the challenge too with these guys, you know, this is maybe this is a, another discussion as we get towards the spring. But man, I wish they would let uh, put an All Star game together and let these underclassmen play in it because this is somebody that could have been in for the go go get around a good quarterback in an All Star game yeah. and show what you can do. But you know, as an underclassman, you don't have that opportunity. It's three years in, everybody kind of forgets about him through the spring because you get all the guys playing in the Senior Bowl East West game and he's just kind of forgotten. And he's not one of those marquee players. He wasn't coming off a big year. If he plays in an all-star game, Buck, I, I think you see his stock go way up. Yeah, the, the people who have to, the people who really knew and could could advocate for Stefan Diggs were the guys that knew him either coming out of high school or very early in his career. And I want to say that Norv Turner's son, Scott Turner, really liked him. I think I read the story where he talked about he kept taking his tape down to George Stewart, the wide receiver coach there, and saying, like, man, I think this is a guy that could be a hidden gem. Um and with, with Diggs, he has all the traits. Like, the return skills means that he brings running skills to the table. He caught a ton of passes at Maryland, so you know that he can catch and do some things. But now the confidence is coming, and when the confidence comes to playmaking and the big plays, we're seeing that the last three games he's been fantastic for the Vikings. All right, well, this is the time now that, that TD, our producer, has been waiting for because he is the mad scientist here. Before we do that, though, you, I, have, you... I have a Diggs question. You know me. I always want to know, who is this guy? Who is Stephon Diggs? What's your, what's your comp for this guy? 
Oh, who, who does he remind you of? Mm -hmm. Man, I need to see more of him. But, I mean, you talk about some of the electricity of the way he plays and kind of the frame. I think Deshaun Jackson's probably a name that comes to mind a little bit just in, in terms of that, that top end speed, that explosiveness, and the frame is a little bit similar to Deshaun. He does, he does have that flair for, for the dramatic. He is explosive. I don't think he's quite as fast as Deshaun, but he has, he has unique gifts, that, that acceleration mm -hmm. with the ball in the air. That's yeah. the thing that you don't Second see, year, go get it. see a lot of guys have, have that. I, I mean, I think I can go with that Deshaun Jackson comparison. because It's I hard think to it's, think of it because he's got kind of that real narrow frame. Kind of narrow frame. Not You know, like maybe some of the T.Y. Hilton type stuff, but he's a that's little a good bigger. Yeah. Um, he has some stuff. But this is a guy that's going to grow into a big role. And Teddy just has this confidence. You can see their chemistry right away. He's going to swallow up some of those balls that used to go in the direction of Mike Wallace and Charles Johnson and those other guys. I think he's going to end up being the primary playmaker. Hey, Coach, what's going on? Welcome back to Move the Sticks. How you doing, man? I am doing great. Another good weekend of football. Another good weekend of football. Another good weekend of tweets from Coach Brian Billick, at Coach Billick, which is... You uh, love my tweets. I, we love your tweets. That's how we like to queue up our, our questions for. It's like you produce the show. I don't know why we need TD for. We just have to just follow your Twitter feed and we're good to go. <laughs> but uh, first one here, you, uh, you fired off... During the, during the games, there are a couple head coaches on the proverbial hot seat that aren't doing anything to help their cause today. Uh, now, I'm just going to kind of read between the lines there and give you some names, and I want to see if you could tell me uh, what your thoughts are on, on how warm that seat might be. We're talking about Chuck Pagano, Caldwell, and Bill O'Brien. Yeah, Chuck Pagano obviously well-documented some of the issues they're having, and, and we talked about it on game day first. Part of the problem for Chuck Pagano is there's an institutional history here. Let's remember that Jim Mora Sr., who had Peyton Manning in his rookie year, went four years, couldn't progress any, and they decided they needed to make a change and ended up coming with uh, Tony Dungy. Uh, now Chuck Pagano, same way. He's been given an Andrew Luck. He's been 11-5 and five for three state seasons. I mean, my gosh. But you've got to continue to progress, and particularly the way they played this last weekend, uh, th this is going to be a tough one for them, obviously, to explain, to hold the team together. Uh, as they're going forward, even though clearly, again, uh, Ryan Grixom's what his responsibility in all this in terms of uh, their inability to staff that defense, some of the older players they brought in aren't, aren't producing. You know, that's a tough one. And Bill O'Brien, my gosh, you know, it, this goes beyond just the lack of the quarterback and them not being able to address the quarterback situation. He took ownership of it when he obviously brought in uh, Brian Hoyer. He had Ryan Mallett brought him in as well. They're not the answer. They're journeymen at best. Uh, defensively, boy, they just, it's unbelievable how bad they looked against Miami. Coach, I want to ask you about those two, and uh, we'll get to call here in a second. But in, in regards to this time of the year, week six, week seven, we're, we're, we're into the season now, and you're the Colts. Coming off last week where you have the debacle on special teams, right, with that fake that went terribly wrong. Then this week on special teams, you give up a fake field goal catch, you fumble a kickoff. You have to burn a timeout because you don't have enough guys on the field on a special teams play. I, mean, I know you, this is your staff and these are your guys. And then we go to, to, to what happens in Houston defensively where they're not even running to the ball. You're talking about 50-plus yard plays where they can't even get a glove on anybody because there's no effort. I'm not seeing any effort when I watch it. At this point in time in the season, would it shock you if we started seeing some collateral damage with some of these assistants being let go? Well, it could, but it really is not going to help because you can find it. To me, that's like finding your third string fullback. OK, <laughs> what kind of message are you going to send uh, to the starters? It's got to kind of be at the top. You can let all the assistants go that you want, trying to shake things up, the players uh, and the energy you talk about. And it's just a lack of focus. It, basically, in order to compete in the NFL, it takes an optimal effort every single play. And if you're off that just a little bit, it's not like they don't want to do well. It's not like they don't want to focus or hustle. But it becomes so transparent, uh, that elite level that you have to compete at, at this level, uh, it becomes glaring in terms of that. And the coach, I mean, how responsible is that for the coach if the players aren't hustling? You can blame that on the coach, and most people will. He may not be responsible, but he's going to be held accountable, along with the mistakes. What's going on during the week that we're making these kind of mistakes, whether it's the special teams gaffe last week or this week, some of the mistakes that are going on? What's going on in the teaching sequence that we're not getting this? You know, Coach, think about the teaching sequence. The Detroit Lions are an interesting case study because last year their defense was lights out. They made a playoff run, uh, suffered a bad call against the Dallas Cowboys that probably prevented them from going on. 
This year, they're really struggling. The quarterback has been up and down. The offense isn't kind of playing to the strengths of the team. If you're Jim Caldwell and you suddenly find yourself on the hot seat, how soon before you kind of put your hand into the offense to see if you can rectify some of the stuff that's going on? Well, and that's a tough one. I've been in that situation before where you've had to feel like you need to reinsert yourself. Uh, Jim Caldwell can certainly do that. The problem is, uh, if you do, when we did it, and, and I let Jim Fossil go uh, for whatever reasons, we kind of caught fire and, and kind of took off offensively. So there I was the guru again, you know, and I was the savior. That's all well and good. What if you go back in, and I know the pressure Joe Lombardi is in Detroit, uh, Caldwell comes in. Let's remember it was Jim Caldwell who took over for Cam Cameron in Baltimore. Uh, and, and all of a sudden they get hot in the playoffs and they win the Super Bowl. So now Jim Caldwell, what he was able to do, now you take over, and let's say you take over the play calling, and it doesn't get better. It's no different than it was before offensively, and Stafford still continues to struggle. You really leave yourself vulnerable as the coach because now management, media, the fans are going, oh, okay, not only are we not winning, but you can't even do what you're supposed to be an expert in in terms of calling offensive plays. Now you are really vulnerable as a coach. Yeah, there's no more butts between you and the door, right? Once you get rid of uh, the play caller and you take that over, there's nobody else to point the finger at. Coach, uh, you tweeted this one out. Boy, was I wrong about the Bills this year. I'll go ahead and let you elaborate on that one. Well, I think we all we all remember seeing the clips of Rex, and we joked about it, how the people in Baltimore or some of our former players and coaches would take exception with Rex. When going into the season, they had the, the Wired segment showing him saying, hey, this is the best defensive personnel I've ever had. These guys are monsters. And we know Rex. He is all in. He sells that passion to his team. They go along. They're not doing very well, particularly on defense. I mean, this was a top three defense last year. Uh, they stumble around, Drek comes out and go, hey, that's my fault. You know, it's my fault we're not playing better. Well, you know what? The players are eventually going to look up and go, okay, maybe you're right. Maybe it is your fault. We did a bit on it this weekend showing where uh, with that defensive line that was supposed to be the strength, uh, they're getting one-on-one -on -one matchups. We showed film after film where you're getting the double on the inside on Darius and Kyle Williams and some of the others. All right, where's the pressure on the outside when they're one-on-one? -on -one? It's just not there. Uh, and then a number of times, obviously, and you hear the players chipping in as well, where, you know, we're not sure about the scheme. We showed where Mario Williams is dropping into coverage, which I know that's not his forte. I, I mentioned that anytime I saw Peter Bulware and, and Michael McCary <laughs> drop into coverage, I'd go over to Rex and go, are they going to do that a lot? Because I'd really <laughs> rather have them go in the other direction. It's part of the scheme that you have to do. So now that they're not functioning well, all the questions are coming up. But my God, you go, I don't care where you go, you lose to Jacksonville, uh, this thing's about ready to explode. You know, Coach, in, in, in talking about this, there's always been this, this notion or myth that a team takes on the personality of the coach. And so because Rex is such a big personality, kind of boisterous, he doesn't strike people as a guy that pays attention to the details. And so when you look at the Buffalo Bills and you see the turnovers and the penalties, is there some truth to that, that notion or that myth where we talk about if a guy's buttoned up, his team is more likely to be buttoned up. Is there something wrong with the Bills in that, that vein? I, you know, I don't know. I, I would reject the thought that, that, that Rex doesn't have attention to detail. He is one of the best detail coaches I've ever been around. That passion that you have. It's not like Tony Dungy wasn't supposed to be competitive because he's so quiet and demure. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I've coached with Tony Dungy and against him. He's, per, he's plenty competitive. So I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think a team can take on the personality of the coach that's putting in a certain structure and covet certain players for that coach, certainly from that standpoint, but it's not like they're all of a sudden going to become Rex Ryan. You embrace the passion. Rex certainly wants that. You also have to keep in mind that the longer you are a head coach, the more you separate yourself from that, those te that team, simply from the standpoint that when you're a position coach or a coordinator, hey, we're in this together and, and, and it's us against the world. When you become the head coach, now the players, you're part of the decisions of who plays, who doesn't play, who gets the money via the cap, who has to go. And so that we're in this together, they, they begin to look at you differently. And it's unavoidable uh, the longer you become a head coach. So Rex is probably falling a little bit victim to that. Not that he's been in Buffalo that long, but he's been a, bit, a head coach long enough. And right now, because they weren't successful so far, and they were supposed to be, naturally the players are going to question the scheme. You know, it's the typical, I confess he did it. <laughs>
Coach, before we get to one more team inside that division, I want to kind of cue up your tweet with a little, a little sound for you that you can hear uh, Dan Campbell in the locker room after the latest win by the Miami Dolphins. You can tell you guys are still starving. That's what you can tell. You cannot eat enough right now. And it feels good, doesn't it? That's a hell of a job. Cam Wake, you guys. Hey, just like you said, it's curing, and I love the way it feels. Ooh. Dolphins on three. One, two, three. Dolphins. All right, Coach, you can tell uh, Dan Campbell, everybody fired up in there. It's a, a starving team, according to him, and they have put out two big wins over the last couple weeks. But you tweeted this out. Uh, a true tenure of his head coaching uh, experience is going to begin Thursday in New England, beating the Titans and the Texans. Nothing to hang your hat on. Yeah, and, and let's give him credit for that. But we saw that, you know, okay, when you're in the bye and you get rid of Joe Philbum, you have an eye to, okay, you got two teams that are very beatable. And so can you get a little momentum on what should be a pretty good team? And that's a calculation that management made in Miami, and so far it's paid off. And they get great credit for that. There's no question. Whatever Dan Campbell's doing, that's great. But we're talking Tennessee and Houston. We're talking about the two worst teams in that division, maybe two of the worst teams in the league right now. Take, you know, a win and a win is in the NFL. Don't, I'm taking nothing away from that. But now we're going to find out. And they've got good momentum, and that's what they're counting on. We'll see how that momentum sustains itself when they have to go to New England, when they're going to obviously then come back. And, and, and they've got three road games. It's not only New England, Buffalo, and Philly, but it's New England, Buffalo, Philly on the road. Now, I'll say this. If they keep cranking off better than 240 yards rushing and their quarterback can throw four touchdowns on 18 of 19, yeah, they're going to be real. If, he, if indeed they are scheming that well, then I'm all in. The, the, but we're going to find out for the next three weeks as they go on the road. You know, Coach, and looking at it, because obviously you sat in that head chair for a long time, when you're looking at a young guy who's aspiring to be a head coach like Dan Campbell is, what are some of the traits that you're looking for? Because you say if it starts on Thursday, in that Thursday night game, what are you looking to see from him? Is it adjustments? Is it the way he handles the team, the way the team performs? What exactly are you looking for to kind of show you like, oh, okay, this guy may get it? How do you handle the team and yourself in critical situations? Uh, I heard Rick Pitino talk about it in a little bit different, obviously, in basketball. But he said, hey, I get the best players I can. Uh, we provide a structure and let them go play. And that there's four or five situations in a game where I have to exert myself as the head coach strategically, tactically, motivationally that, that are going to affect the game. And it's not unlike that being a head coach. You get the best players you can. You have your structure. Your assistants are interacting with it. You give them the best opportunity you can because you can't walk across that white line onto the field. But they're going to be maybe four or five critical calls, whether you're going forward on fourth down or you're punting, the transition of your offense and defense, the different modes you may put them in. If all of a sudden you're down by 21 points, you know, we saw that challenge of uh, Jay Gruden with that Washington Redskin team. Maybe the biggest challenge to his tenure as a head coach where all of a sudden you're down and, and they hung on and they kept coming back. And not only hang on emotionally, but tactically, strategically did some things. Those are the challenges and they very well may face these. We're talking about Miami now over the next three weeks on the road that makes it even difficult. That's where we're going to find out if indeed Dan Campbell can step up into those shoes, hold this team together, and make those tough decisions. Yeah, big challenge going to be if they can keep that running game cranked up, if they can keep Ryan Tannehill playing at that same elite level. Coach, speaking of quarterbacks, you got an article coming out Wednesday. You're writing about the Panthers and Cam Newton and the growth that he's made in his young career. Can't wait to read that. But more importantly, I want that Brian Billick bobblehead that's over your shoulder back there. I, I, Christmas yeah, is coming we're up. We're going to have to – you know what, next time – Next time we do the show, I got a, a little mini me that's about 10 times that size. Oh, I'm man. just going to sit it here and bob the head. We'll have oh, some fun with that. That's fantastic. Look, Christmas isn't far away, coach. That's all I'm saying. Well, I, I know what you, yeah, I got to remember. I got to tell you a quick story. Remember when the Fransoni at Alabama left Alabama to go to Texas A&M? Yep. They had crates of his little bobbleheads. Some guy at a golf course bought like 10 bo 15 boxes of them, charged 20 bucks a head for people to come up, tee it up, and take their seven iron to that head of that bobblehead. So that's a, there's a lot of purposes you could use for those bobbleheads. That's fantastic. What a way to end it, Coach. That's a walk-off. Thank hey. you. You're the best. We'll see you back here next week. All right, guys. I yeah. enjoy it. Oh, he's the best. Coach Brian Billick. Uh, and, again, make sure you check out his article Wednesday, NFL.com, talking about Cam Newton. 
uh, in the Carolina Panthers. Buck, that's going to do it for us today. Jam-packed show, lots of goodies out there. we got some video coming up uh, later in the week. Uh, you can check that out as well. Thanks for people that are downloading us on iTunes. The YouTube videos have done really well. That's right. Keep feeding the YouTube. So keep checking that out. NFL.com slash podcast and go to the YouTube.com slash NFL. We'll see you back here next week. Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky. Thanks for downloading Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. For more, go to NFL.com slash podcasts.